Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays of the month. Uh, the first Monday of every month, I do a subscriber Sunday video where subscribers send in photos of things in their yard that they're proud of. You can send photos to this email address right here if you're interested in participating in that. I think we're maybe two weeks away, something like that from the uh, April uh, subscriber Sunday video. If you have gardening questions, you can ask them down below this video and uh, uh, that will also enter you in a drawing for a uh, gift card from plantsbymail.com. Uh, thanks again to plantsbymail.com for participating on my channel. Uh, there's a $50 gift card being given away by making a comment below this video uh, in the comment section. You can also go over to my Instagram, at uh, HortTube, and uh, make a comment below. Well, I'm, I'll put a photo uh, from this video over there. It'll be obvious uh, which, which one is the Plants by Mail uh, posting. Uh, make a comment down below that post uh, today and uh, that will give you a second opportunity to win a second gift card and then go over to uh, my uh, Facebook, um, facebook.com forward slash HortTube and uh, make a comment below this uh, video where I'm posting this video over there as well. That'll give you three opportunities to win three, uh, three different gift cards, $50 gift cards. I'm going to do the drawing next Sunday for those. They're also sending me some plants uh, this week, and so you'll see uh, me unbox a few things uh, sometime around Thursday, something like that. Uh, this week's schedule, uh, tomorrow um, I have a, uh, the wind is picking up and it's quite cold and I'm in short sleeves. Uh, I have a, a how to read a plant tag video uh, coming up, which will seem very obvious to some people, but uh, to others I hope it's gonna be helpful. I'm, I'm just gonna point out some things you need to know, you know, just to, to read, a, read a plant tag. Um, uh, well, and uh, Tuesday, I don't remember. I have something for Tuesday as well. Wednesday will be the update video from this yard. I've got some plants going in the ground between now and then. Uh, Thursday, I'm finally going to do the soil test uh, video. Thursday or Friday uh, will be the soil test uh, video. I'm sorry that's taking a little while longer. Things keep jumping ahead of it or, you know, maybe, maybe I have some mental block on it or whatever. But I'll have the uh, soil test result video from this yard. Uh, th before this week's over, and I'll have a third part to this uh, series of spring flowering plants. So quite a busy week of videos coming up. And I think that's it. So thank thanks again to plantsbymail.com for participating uh, uh, on my channel. Like I say, uh, they do a great job. And if you uh, uh, make the comment down below here and then watch that video Thursday when I unbox stuff, you'll, you'll, you'll see the quality of their material. And then next Sunday, I'll do the drawing for the uh, gift cards from uh, all three uh all three places. Okay, um, let's get started on the questions from uh, last week. And like I say, if you have questions, you can ask them. Uh, ask, if you, your question can be enter you into the uh, drawing for the plantsbymail.com gift card. Okay, somebody asked me about, they had heard azaleas are poisonous uh, to bees. And that's not necessarily um, what the issue is. Azalea, um, when honeybees make honey from the nectar from azaleas, um, it can be har potentially harmful. Uh, to, to humans. Uh, keep in mind that um, azalea flowers are kind of designed for, you know, bumblebees go in them and they have to kind of bully their way down in there. It's a very deep uh, flower and uh, they're actually, some of them are actually designed for hummingbirds uh, to, to pollinate and, and, that, and that kind of thing. There's not a lot of interaction, um, I don't think, between the uh, honeybees and them anyway, but it's not doing anything negative to the bees uh, and um, keep in mind that honeybees are not our native bees anyway. I mean, bumblebees and other bees that have been been here with rhododendrons and um, um, azaleas forever. Uh, you don't have any problem with them whatsoever. Okay, somebody asked me about moving a large clara now, and I don't know how large large is, but if it's something that's head high or bigger, you definitely want to cut it back some, and uh, and and then you, you could move it. You could move it now. I actually did a video. You can find on my channel, I think it was something like preparing a large plant to move. And if you don't necessarily need to move it right this second, uh, I actually took a camellia, which camellias are notoriously hard to move and, and moved one successfully by going and cutting the roots around the outside, cutting the plant back hard and cutting the roots. And basically I created what amounted to a pot uh, in the ground and had all, the, and then I went occasionally and I cut the roots again and just made sure all the roots stayed in a kind of a containment zone. And then I moved it um, six or seven months later. Um, so if you have that option, that is a very good option to do. Uh, and it's, I call it healing in place. Um, and and uh, so you, 
I did half of the move in the first step and then the other half of the move in the second step. But yeah, if you wanted to move it now would be the time. You'd probably want to take it back at least 25%, maybe a third, and then, uh, and then get as much of the root system as you can get. Uh, okay. Um, somebody asked me, how does a tree grow? I guess they were having some argument about how, you know, how, how trees grow over, over time. And, you know, the trees, um, the, grow from a grow from a central leader and the very tips of all the branches are where the new growth happened and so if you have a limb that's four foot off the ground when it's you know whatever age it is right now if you come back in a hundred years it's still going to be four feet off the ground the limbs don't go up at all or move uh, at all only the new growth happens in the very tips we won't talk about xylem and phylum and all the things that we learned um, back in high school um, <laughs> with this answer, but the answer to your question is all the growth happens up at the top and then and uh, same thing on the roots the, you know on the, on the roots the, it's the very tips of the roots that have the cells that divide in such a way as to extend themselves. Okay, um, let's see. Somebody asked me when to uh, uh, when to prune a butterfly bush and that's definitely now the February checklist video is when I prune the ones that are back here behind the camera. If you want to see in that video, I, I go after them very hard. Cut them down to about 18 inches tall. Um, you can be, you can just be a butcher on them. They only bloom on new growth. There's, there's no point in having a six foot tall butterfly bush going into spring because it's going to have to grow and there, and it has weak wood. And if you let one get ever, ever get eight or nine or 10 feet tall, it definitely has the potential to split open and then, and can actually kill them. Uh, somebody asked me about spring or fall planting a large quantity of plants. It's always a good question. Uh, if you're in the southeast United States, fall is a slightly better time than spring planting. I don't want to sell it as, the, you know, it's, it's, it's a major difference. But the difference being that when you plant in the fall, you have more times for things to get rooted in before the first summer. And summer is the thing that's going to kill plants in the southeast. You know, not, not necessarily, not the winter typically. Um, so... Would you, um, if you were going to plant a large quantity of things that you couldn't water easily, then fall is definitely the answer. If you can water them easily, uh, if you have access to a water hose nearby wherever you're planting, I'd get them in the ground in the spring and uh, get it behind me. I'm, I'm certainly always somebody who says, you know, get it, get it, get it done, get it behind you, get them in the ground, uh, start getting them established. And so, okay, let's see. Somebody asked me the difference between using a seed starting mix and a propagation mix. I use a seed starting mix. If you've watched any of my videos where I'm doing seed, um, you know, seeding for anything that's inside. I use a, a, a seed starting mix that is going to be mostly um, some sort of fluffy material that has a wicking ability because I don't want to water my seedlings from the top. Okay. I want to water the bottom of the tray. Uh, and, and I'll show you that on Wednesday's update video. I'll show you how I water in here. Um, I put the water in from the, I have a solid tray on the bottom. I can just water from the bottom and then the, and then the mix wicks it up. You would definitely not want that in a propagation mix. You definitely, you can take a seed starting mix and mix some fine pine bark um, or some perlite into it, something that will create some drainage and allow water to, uh, to drain from it. Uh, if, you keep your prop, if you keep your cuttings too wet while you're doing propagation, uh, they will, uh, um, they'll rot in a hurry. And so keep that in mind. That's the difference. That's the difference. The same materials, one propagation mix needs to drain better than a seed starting mix. There's your answer. Okay. Um, then somebody asked me, how do I source plants? Of course, <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time, so I just go to whatever, you know, nurseryman that I've known forever. But if I was going to do this from, uh, from not having that ability, uh, your independent garden center is going to be your best place to go. Most of them, hopefully, uh, in the wintertime, they're going to their state um, shows. Like in North Carolina, we have... Uh, uh, a show called Green and Grow, and it's in Greensboro, North Carolina in January every year. And all the nurserymen from the whole state uh, congregate there and show off what they're going to have for the season, their price list, and, and, and some, some part of their inventory they bring with them in January. Some of them even for stuff in greenhouses, and, you know, it's, it's quite beautiful. All the testing is done for landscape contractors. I had took my landscape contractor exam there, my certified plantsman test there. A lot of state-related testing and that kind of thing goes on during it. But this is where all the garden centers and landscapers go to see who has what and uh, what they're going to have available for the spring. They book plants there. And so that sh your independent garden center should know where to grab something, even if it's not something they're typically stocking. Okay, and so call them first. And uh, maybe it's not a... Maybe it's not 
maybe it'll just register something in their mind. Oh, I saw that at the show. I know who has it. Maybe they picked up catalogs from people they don't normally do business with and they'll try them out. Uh, so that first, and of course, uh, you know, I do get some things mail order. I've got some plants by mail stuff coming this week. You saw, I did that Mr. Maple video a little while back and, um, you know, I went up to Pine Knot and did a tour and, and did that tour video there. They do uh, mail order hellebores. And so, you know, I definitely will do um, mail order from specialty for some specialty things that you're just not going to find uh, in other places. So there's another long answer from Jim. Um, somebody asked me about their peonies flopping over every year. And uh, if there's some sort of problem, you know, they make those little metal things that'll hold the peony flowers up and keep them from blowing over. But if yours are just naturally floppy all the time, I wonder if it's too much, if it's any, in any shade, because they definitely like to uh, cook. Uh, the ones I planted in that peony planting video, which I think all, I think all seven are popping up now, uh, are, uh, you know, they're out here in the full, full sun. I, I don't have a lot of great sun options in this backyard, full, full sun. It ha everything has to be over that way. And so, uh, uh, that could be an issue. Uh, keep in mind, and I'll tell you this, I'll tell you guys this over and over and over again. If it's not making you happy, erase it and, you know, go, go get some different peonies. If they're in the full sun and it's just some variety that stretches too much and ends up flopping over and causes you a problem every year, if you can't figure out a way to support them, go buy some new ones. Um, somebody asked me about, uh, uh, they had planted a dappled willow. I don't remember where they were and if they needed to do anything else to it. Uh, no, <laughs> no, you can plant it, fertilize it, water it, and then it, it'll be fine. Dappled willows are um, little shrubby uh, willows that, uh, I can't remember what that one, uh, here, Hakira Noshiki. That's the one I used to grow. It's a variegated one. I'm assuming it's the one that they have. It's be they're beautiful plants. They blow around in the wind. Be variegated. It's a variegated a uh, willow that maybe gets, well, heck, they can probably get eight or 10 feet tall if you let them. Most people keep them about head high. It's a weed, you can't hurt it. Um, probably should be some sort of test for dappled willows. If you kill one, you move to a different hobby. That, that's a joke. Um, somebody asked me about fertilizing tulips, and I know the general consensus is to fertilize tulips in the fall. That's when they send out their roots uh, for the next uh, season. I, I just don't think about bulbs that I would have in the ground during the fall. It's not even going to register in my mind that I have daffodils or anything else in the yard uh, during that time. And so I fertilize them in the spring after they flower. Fertilize everything in your yard, avoid the tulips until they finish blooming. And then I know where they are at that time. And I go ahead and fertilize around them at that time. If you're using an organic fertilizer, that'll be fine. But like I say, the general consensus is fall is the best time to prune tulips. Um, I, I never have. Um, Somebody asked me, oh, they had just put in drip irrigation, wanted to know how long to run it. Um, here's the thing, I would, before you mulch back over it, and this would, this would be important, hopefully, hopefully you haven't mulched back over it, I would run it and see how long it takes to thoroughly saturate the area, and then that's going to be your timing uh, going forward. Uh, if you've already covered it up, you can go and uncover a spot and you can take a pan and put under one of the drippers and just see how long it takes you to put maybe an inch of water into a shallow pan and uh, go with that and, and see if that's working out for you. But unfortunately, here's another, here's another thing when people ask me these watering questions, everybody's soil type is different. Everybody's, you know, the drainage, the, my, my, my clay soil in this yard is not bad. You guys have seen me digging in it. It's really super easy. It is clay though. There's clay soils though in North Raleigh that are you know just hard as a rock. I know what they're dealing with. I landscaped up there for years. It takes a pickaxe for basically every hole. It's the hardest red clay. Uh, and it, when it's dry, it's particularly bad. That soil, once it's, it's almost impossible to get it wet, but once it's wet, it holds water for a long time. And so when you're asking me these watering questions, they're going to, unfortunately, you have to test how long it takes to thoroughly saturate it and then you need to gauge how many days it's taking to dry out in between. And that's going to be your set of watering rules. The guy five blocks away may have another, a different set of watering rules. And so keep, keep that in mind. There is no answer to that. It's only your conditions. Okay, um, somebody asked me about water standing in their clay soils. This is another one where you, I, and I've had this experience many times where you, somebody's planted something and I go in on a landscape job and. Um, there's just the soil, the soil for whatever reason doesn't drain. Maybe it's a particularly flat lot and you can stick a shovel in the ground and hear squishing 
where the water's standing in every hole you dig. Because, you know, when you dig, when you dig a hole in clay soils, you're digging a kind of a clay pot in the ground. And so anytime the water is passing over, it's gonna fall into that hole. And then if it doesn't drain particularly well, if it doesn't perk well, uh, then it ends up standing at the bottom of the holes. I think you're going to have to probably put in some sort of drainage um, through this, some sort of French drain through the middle of whatever space it is that's holding water like that in order to move that water away. That would have been what I would have recommended for any customer I had was to put some sort of French drain you know, along a found foundation beds are particularly bad about this because you quadruple the water if it's coming off the roof or overflowing gutters or where the downspouts are, that kind of thing. So French drain would be helpful. If not, you need to plant your plants almost right on top of the ground. And uh, that's what I would do. I would dig holes like you're gonna dig them in deep, amend the soil, put a lot of the soil back in and put your plants in and maybe have them as much as halfway out of the ground and just bring the soil up to the edge of them like that. Uh, that's the other alternative, is just to plant basically on top of the ground. Uh, and uh, the plants will be okay And if you, if you do that. I've done that before. I've had areas where you're either competing with tree roots or, or water-related issues. And I have, I, I did a, style. He's eating, are you eating grass? No, 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 no. Can you go, oh my God. Every, I don't know if you can even see it, actually. Okay, good. <laughs> see, it's no, no more eating grass, no more. Uh, I have had jobs in the past where I've actually mounted bark up uh, maybe a foot and a half tall and planted directly into the bark and then ran a drip line across the top of the bark. And so I'm basically just created a whole new root area above the ground in order to avoid those kind of drainage issues or root related issues uh, where you just couldn't dig things into the ground. But it is the pain, but you're probably going to have to fix it with a French drain uh, sometime in the future. So. There were more than this, but I'm gonna stop it here. Um, I'll answer questions from uh, that you asked on this video next week, and if there's not enough of them, I'll go back and grab a few more. Uh, again, make any kind of comment down below. Um, I know the world is upside down right now. Let's don't talk about that in the comments. Let's talk about happy gardening things. And uh, again, make a comment on this video. Go over to, find me on Instagram. Follow me over there on Instagram. I, I, I really do keep, keep this place more up to date on Instagram than anywhere else. And um, I do a lot of what I call urban botanizing. I walk around the city of Raleigh and I um, find interesting things. And uh, I think you'll find some of the photos that I put up. I had a, uh, a cedar growing out of an oak two days ago. I took a beautiful photo of downtown Raleigh from some railroad tracks um, a couple days ago, things like that. Follow me over there and uh, make a comment um, below this post today uh, and then over on Facebook. Three chances to win to plantsbymail.com gift cards. Thanks for watching.